से इसका बिजमिल्लाम सो टूडे फर्स्ट वी विल डिस्कस द नेचर ऑफ इकोनॉमिक थ्योरी एंड आई वॉन्ट टू एक्सप्लेन दैट इकोनॉमिक थ्योरी इज रियली द इकोनॉमिक थ्योरी ऑफ द टॉप वन परसेंट एंड आई वॉन्ट टू डिस्कस एट डिसेप्टिव कॉन्सेप्ट सेवन सो इट्स यूजफुल टू नेम दिस एज एटी वन परसेंट रैदर दैन इकोनॉमिक थ्योरी बिकॉज बेसिकली वट एज आई प्रजेंटेड एट द इस्लामिक इकोनॉमिक्स वर्कशॉप वी वॉन्ट टू डिफ्रेंशिएट बिटवीन कन्वेंशनल इकोनॉमिक्स एंड इस्लामिक इकोनॉमिक्स दैन यू कैन से दैट कन्वेंशनल इकोनॉमिक्स इज एटी वन परसेंट इट इज डिफेंड्स द इंटरेस्ट ऑफ द टॉप वन परसेंट एंड इस्लामिक इकोनॉमिक्स इज एटी नाइन्टी परसेंट इट डिफेंड्स द इंटरेस्ट ऑफ द बॉटम नाइन्टी परसेंट सो ना वन इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग अबाउट एटी वन परसेंट इज दैट इट मस्ट अपियर टू बी फेयर एंड न्यूट्रल बट इट मस्ट एक्चुअली बी स्ट्रांगली बायस टूअर्ड द वेल्थी it cannot you know you cannot have a economic theory which says explicitly that yes all the wealthy should get even more wealth so if that if you say that you can the wealthy might believe that but they would be then they won't be able to sell this program to the others so it's very important to be able to sell this so the packaging must be different from the reality one very important example just to illustrate the idea there was this ancient uh, persian philosopher maybe a prophet i don't know a mazdak and he said that there should be no such thing as private property everything belongs to everybody so this seems like a very good idea for the poor that okay now i can have a share in the wealth of the rich people and there are so many poor people they should be able to and if somebody has a huge palace then he doesn't own it and i can also use it so it has the appearance of being good for the poor but the reality was that the rich people had all the power they had the forces they had the security and so uh, they could defend their properties against anybody coming in and furthermore they could go and grab any property of anybody who was poor that they liked and uh, the philosophy provide the justification you know it doesn't really belong to you <laughs> so uh exact this is exactly the nature of et1% that it appears to be fair or even fair favorable to the poor and it actually is quite the opposite so exactly this characteristic is true of all of these eight concepts so the first concept is scarcity so obviously uh it seems to be objective factual why don't poor have enough people uh, enough uh, goods why can't they eat because there's not <coughs> enough food couldn't there couldn't be anything more natural and obvious so what's the solution let's grow some more food now this is all wrong this theory and this idea it's all deception the first problem is that there is a the needs of people and the wants are mixed up so if the millionaire wants a music concert to uh celebrate for his uh, anniversary at uh, spending wasting yani thousands of dollars uh that is the same thing as uh the hungry child who wants milk uh yani at the level of demand but actually if the poor children want to have milk and bread and there is no money which is backing that then that is not an effective demand then the actually the priority is given to the wants of the rich so all the problem of scarcity arises because economic theory deliberately fails to distinguish between wants and needs and this is a new development it was not always there uh in the early 1930s when the scarcity definition was introduced by lion robbins then 
these two things got mixed up. Otherwise, it was clear to the economists that the uh, fulfilling needs is more important priority than fulfilling wants. So, if we uh, think again about needs and wants and differentiate them, then at the level of needs, there is no scarcity. There is enough food for everybody on the planet. There is enough, I mean, all of the basic needs, the food, clothing, housing, education, health, all of this can be provided to everybody on the planet. We have enough resources. It's not that there is less resources than that is necessary. So, no, uh, there is no scarcity, so additional growth is not needed. We, the only question is one of redistribution. Some people who have more than what they need and some people have less than what they need. So, the central question of economics should be, how do we get goods from those who have more to those who have less? But, of course, this would be against the interest of the wealthy. So, they say, no, no, don't look in this direction, look in the other direction. So, Samuelson, Nordhaus and many other economists say similar things, that the economist's job is to satisfy all demands, whether it's genuine or whether it's artificial. So, we don't care. And as long as somebody is saying, I want this, then we don't ask the question, is this a genuine, legitimate uh, demand or is this uh, uh, artificial fake, um, temporary, unnecessary demand. So now the problem is that needs, you have a finite amount of, when you have food and you eat and your stomach is full, so that, that cannot be infinite, insatiable, but wants, they have the property as given in Hadith that if you give a man one mountain of gold, he will want another one. They keep expanding, the more you get, the more you want. So in fact, you cannot fulfill wants. So the idea of, uh, so obviously, yeah, the more you do, the, so, so there is no solution. So growth is not a solution to fulfilling the wants. And furthermore, fulfilling wants does not lead to happiness. That's another important uh, factor. This is the Coca-Cola theory of happiness. The more you uh, satisfy your desire, the more happy you will be. It has no, no relation to reality. So this scarcity, this is a deception. The reality, 80-90%, what Islam teaches, is that needs are important, you should fulfill them. Wants are not important, you should not fulfill them. Allah Ta'ala says that, so, um, that hawa or idle desire is, uh, is going to lead people to Jahannam. So, now the Islamic economist's job unlike the <coughs> conventional economist, is that we should try to make sure that there is nobody hungry, that everybody can get health care, education, but we are, our not, job is not to fulfill the demand for luxury cars and demand for uh, fancy hotels and things like that. That's not uh, our job. Um, Islam teaches that there should be no israf, excess consumption. Yes, kulu, washrabu, eat and drink. But la, tusrifu, don't uh, spend excess. So this is very different from insatiable wants. Uh, Islam says that you should not envy others if they are having more than you. And also it says that you should not do conspicuous consumption. That is, eat something in order to make other people jealous of you. Islam encourages the circulation of wealth. Wealth should not be confined to a small group of people. And uh, it, so basic issue is one of distribution. So Islam has both carrot and stick. It says that uh, zakat can be taken by force by, from anybody, although it is a form of worship, but if somebody doesn't want to give, still we can take it. And then there is uh, voluntary. <coughs> uh, wealthy are encouraged to give to the poor. So basically the key problem of economics is not one of growth, it is one of redistribution. And by talking about scarcity, you prevent people from realizing the solution. Actually, growth keeps happening, has happened for 100 years, but what happens is that all of the fruits of the growth go to the rich. A study showed that for the last 10 years, a lot of growth has happened, but 85% of the growth has been taken by the top 1%, and nothing has reached the bottom 50%. The middle has some, some portion of it. So, growth is not the solution because 
you keep on growing and the wealthy keeps on growing wealthy. So scarcity points in the wrong direction. It is meant to deceive the people into not thinking about the real solution because the real solution hurts the wealthy. It forces them to give their wealth. So as we discussed also earlier that Pareto optimality is another red herring of 81%. Again, it has the appearance of appealing. Yeah, give more to everybody. Society will be made better off. Who could object to that? But well, the implication is that if you only give money to the wealthy, that is also good for society. And actually, Martin Feldman uh, argues exactly that, that uh, as long as nobody is wealth made worse off, if the wealthy earn more wealth, what's the harm in that? Even though... The Quran says that actually if you give more wealth to people, they will become rebellious. And that's what happens there. And with more wealth, they get more power and they exploit and oppress the poor more. So actually, Islam opposes this, that even giving everybody more wealth is not going to make them better off. In fact, the Hadith says that the best level of risk is the one that is just enough for your needs, not more and not less. So... Feeding the poor by taxing the rich is not good for society according to the Pareto principle because you uh, don't uh, increase the uh, welfare of everybody. Uh, property rights are sacred. You cannot take anything away from anybody. If, even if the rich man has more than what he can do with, if somebody is starving, taking money away from him, his property right is sacred. His right to food is not important. So again, this is a moral judgment that is hidden inside Pareto optimality, which is not <coughs> obvious. <coughs> so, if we want to oppose this by Islamic principles, then we have to say that no needs have to be prioritized over wants. So, if we want to think about it in terms of Pareto, let's say there's a hadith that man says, my wealth, my wealth, but his wealth is only that which he can... <coughs> eat and uh, wear and spend exactly so let us consider then that uh, your welfare is determined not by the money in your bank but by what you can actually use so anything that is beyond what you can use does not add to your welfare so now if we consider this then we say that okay take money from people who have more than what they can use and give it to those who are hungry, then there is a welfare improvement because they get to consume and the other person's consumption is not damaged at all. So then that is a Pareto improvement. So if, if we redefine Pareto improvement in this way, then we will um, uh, do better. So basically, as long as you can fulfill somebody's basic needs without reducing the need uh, of others, then you have an improvement. This would be an Islamic principle and it would cause massive distribution. People who have, the 50 people who have more than half the world's wealth, they would be, have to give that money to the, those who are in need. So that's uh, very different from the Pareto principle and much more sensible. <coughs> so the invisible hand is another part of the 81%. What it says is that let people behave selfishly. It's good for society. So, uh, in particular, it gives the license to the wealthy that let them do whatever they want, let them, uh, let them get even more wealth and it will be good to society because it will be trickled down eventually to everybody. So, this is simply false and Iman Kiff says explicitly that society is helped not by the generosity and kindness, love and kindness, it is helped by the selfish behavior in the, in the introduction. So actually, uh, this is just a philosophy, which is simply not true. There's, you can trace the disadvantages. Um, Great Depression, global financial crisis, wars, and uh, everything. A lot of bad things are caused by selfish behavior. Corporate greed has caused a lot of damage to the world, killing babies for profit and so on. So economics... Uh, started out as a branch of moral philosophy and one of the <coughs> part of understanding 81% is to understand that it is still a branch of moral philosophy. It's making moral judgments. Here it is saying 
that selfish behavior is good for society. And this is a moral judgment. It has no reality. So this is a normative principle that is being imposed upon you in disguise as a positive fact. And you are being told that uh, let everybody be greedy and it will be good for society. <laughs> and now actually <clears throat> this is a moral principle. This is not a, a positive statement. But it is disguised. It is said no, this is a theorem. This is a positive uh, result of Adam Smith. So this justifies the bad behavior of the wealthy people that uh, even though they seem to behave badly, an invisible hand will make it good. So to oppose this we have ET 90% which says that the intentions determine the value of these. In al amal bin niyat. So if somebody is doing something for a bad intention then nothing good can come of it. Except sometimes by accident it might happen but in general this is not true. This is, there is no law which says that everybody should behave selfishly and then suddenly the society will become better. That's ridiculous. Uh, so the relevant paradigm which is most often the case is the prisoner's dilemma that um, if somebody behaves selfishly it causes harm to society and it might cause him personal benefit temporarily but actually it will even hurt him. So selfish behavior hurts everybody and often hurts the person who is behaving selfishly. So um, now the more evidence has come in in terms of the evolution of cooperation which says that and if economists believe, they still believe, they haven't uh, learned about these evolutionary biology results, that selfishness is good for society but actually uh, and there is the survival of the fittest. But this is not true. It turns out that if we cooperate uh, the group survival chances become much higher. So the 80-90% would say that cooperation and generosity create socially beneficial outcomes. Selfishness, competition, etc. These create so socially harmful outcomes. Um, you, uh, you have been told about the chickens, right? So basically the chickens example shows that yani competition and this is actually how cap competition works. The, the people who succeed in competition do not do so by having higher efficiency but by destroying their opponents and so causing damage. And that's what I mean Microsoft does and sort of evil corporation. They make sure that the competitors don't survive rather than improving their efficiency. <clears throat> so again 81% is the production function which creates an equality between capital and labor which doesn't exist according to the production function both of them are inputs and then both of them are rewarded according to the same principle but this is simply not true the capitalists who own the machines are the bosses the laborers are the uh, are the employees they have to obey orders they sell their lives in order to feed their children the capitalists under no such, such compulsion there is a massively unequal uh, relationship <coughs> and so uh, this is illustrated by this uh, dramatic rise in the CEO pay which according to economic theory just reflects their marginal product of labor but that's ridiculous. There are lots of evidence that can be given in the anti-textbook. It gave the evidence that why you cannot justify it as an increasing productivity. So um, the chief executive, because they are boss, they can capture all of the profit or most of the profit and that's what they do and they exploit the laborers. So <clears throat> basically what happens and this is again part of the deception of the theory, it says that okay the, uh, the um, laborers get their marginal product, the capital gets its marginal product and profits are zero in the long run. No one mentions that. What, ha what happens in the short run? In the short run, you have, uh, co even according to their theory, actually short run, long run, I don't know about that, but corporation earns billions of dollars of profits. So what happens to that profit? Well, it will become zero in the long run. But okay, what's happening to this now? That's all going in the pocket of the chief executive. So why it's not going to the laborer? That's because their laborers are being exploited. But the economic theory doesn't mention it. The, the profits 
are disappeared from the theory. So this is another part of the deception of the labor theory that you study. There are zero profits. Every student gets very puzzled when he reads that. that how come the corporations have zero profits? <laughs> That's because you don't want to talk about the profits because then if you talk about non-zero profits, then you will see, see. Basically, economic theory is a way to protect capitalism from the accusation that was made by Karl Marx that the capitalists exploit the laborers. So the production function theory is just one part of the defense and it says that both of them get the same and there are no excess profits. If there was excess profits, then you would have to see that there is exploitation. So economic theory of the 90% which Islam <coughs> teaches us, <coughs> in capitalism there is adversarial relationship. The capitalist is the boss and he wants to get the most work out of his laborers and the laborers are um, slaves, wage slaves and they want to do minimize work and get maximum wage and this is the labor theory, disutility of labor. But Islam has an entirely different conception of work. It's first of all, it uh, tells the employer that your uh, servants are your brothers whom Allah Ta'ala has placed under your protection. And then the conception of the firm is not that uh, uh, the employee is not a wage slave. Actually, all the people, the, the machines, and the, they are all engaged in a productive work to provide some valuable service to society. So no matter what you do, you are actually uh, providing service to society. So you're doing socially valuable work. And all people are equal in this regard. So... The honest traders will stand with the Siddiqeen and the Shohada and the Salihin. So their uh, effort will be to serve the creation of Allah out of the love of Allah. Because all of the creation of Allah is the family of Allah. So unlike the MBA program where the bottom line is the profits, the bottom line of the Islamic firm would be to provide the maximum amount of service. And then... If this firm does pollution, then they will say, oh, we are not serving the people. So they will automatically try to avoid pollution or any other harm because their bottom line is not the number of dollars they earn, it's the bottom number is the amount of service being provided. So they will have an entirely different framework for how they do their work. And there exist such firms already in the world, although there are very few. So again, part of 81% is the equation of the welfare society with GNP per capita. Instead of measuring how much different classes get, you put it all together and divide by the total number of people and thereby hide the inequality in the society. And you say that this is the welfare of the society. You don't measure the welfare by looking at what the bottom 50% is getting, how many people cannot eat. These are the things that matter to measure the welfare. These are disappeared from the picture and instead you take all of the wealth of the poor and you give it to the all of the wealth of the rich and you share it equally with the poor before measuring it. If you measured it be, uh, before, before uh, dividing it equally then you would discover that only the wealthy are getting rich. So, you, so again this is a kind of a deception. This is a mythical and imaginary figure, the GNP per capita. It measures something that should happen, but it doesn't. The wealth is not equally divided. So some people who realize that, look, what's happening is that you're saying GNP per capita, but all of the gains are going to the rich. So then the answer is a trickle down. That Okay, yes, it is true. In temporary short run, this has happened, but in the long run, it will all benefit everybody. So there's a chart which shows that Wealth has been increasing constantly, but poverty has not declined as a result. So to oppose GNP per capita, we, we could uh, ask for a different way to measure that. Islam says that Israf is bad, so if somebody consumes more than he needs, that doesn't count towards the welfare of the society. So we only count consumption up to the level of, uh, of basic needs. After that, it's just optional, superfluous, excess. So if we count that, then 
no matter how much excess uh, GNP is produced, it doesn't count towards welfare unless it goes to fulfill somebody's genuine needs, not the artificial needs. So then we would have an entirely different measure of social welfare, which would be much more accurate than GNP per capita. So again, uh, by isolating economics from politics, previously economics was political economy, then you hide the connections between the wealth and power. So the Quran says that if people are given more wealth, then they can become rebellious, which means that they will do zulm and oppression. And this is exactly what happens. The rich and the powerful dominate the world and they create theories which they uh, deceive the poor into believing, which actually harms their interests. Like look at this Trump the millionaire. And um, uh, he says to the poor that I will take care of your interests. And the amazing thing is that the poor believed him. <laughs> so how, how come? Yani, how can he manage to? Because they have the control of the media and they... So, we, there are many examples of how the corporations have deceived people into buying their products. Uh, I think just recently, yesterday, New York State sued uh, of the big pharma for making people addicted to drugs because they just sell drugs. So, it's, the suit has just been filed for $50 million or something again in New, by New York State. So basically the job of the drug industry is to sell drugs and they invent diseases and then they invent the drugs like there is this attention deficit disorder. So you know if you put a child of age 5 or 6 or 7 into the classroom, children are not built to sit in a chair for hours. So they start fidgeting. So what is this? This is a attention deficit disorder. <laughs> you should let him go out and play. So you give them a drug, so that, that tranquilizes them. They sit like stones in the same. And this is, and you sell um, millions of dollars of drugs this way. And the, the, the examples like this are many. Where <coughs> so um, the political economy would have revealed that the power, how the powerful use their power to control the economy. So you cut off the links between economy and politics so that these connections are not visible to the economist. So basically what the basic, uh, the basic uh, thesis of Marx is that you know you have in the economics you have production and then you have distribution. So according to the neoclassical theory the distribution is done according to marginal product everyone gets what they deserve. Marx said that uh, Different groups get according to their power. So now this concept, which is easy to prove, uh, doesn't, and you can't even state this concept because the concept of power is not there in economics because everyone is an individual. This is again another philosophical maneuver called uh, um, methodological individualism. It says that don't look at groups because a group is just a collection of individuals. So this is actually a, 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 and it seems like a very logical thing, but it is actually very wrong because people act in groups and groups can wield a lot of power. An individual cannot do anything. So you cannot analyze the behavior of an individual in isolation. You have to know which group he belongs to in order to be able to find what his behavior is. So this, uh, this philosophy is bogus, but it is very helpful to capitalists to hide the role of power. So, 80-90%, the opposition to this is all about taming the powerful. How do you take care? So, there is persuasion. You Quran is full of targheeb to the rich, that the wealth is given to you so, so as to help the poor not to exploit them. Then there are institutions. There is zakat, which is forcible. And then there is sadaqat. And there is waqf. In the Islamic society, for a thousand years, there was lots of waqfs which took care of all social needs. So basically that, that's a social norm that the wealthy are told there were no banks first of all where they can multiply money. Accumulation of money was not viewed in a pleasant light uh, so that somebody is 
stingy and he is accumulating wealth. This is not a good thing. So, <clears throat> uh, people were encouraged to spend their money on others. So, they did. They created these waqf and they would uh, help the poor and that would give, give them social stand, status and standing. So, all of these social norms and institutions and persuasion, these work to uh, prevent the powerful from exploiting the poor. And the laws also are like that. Unlike that, in the capitalism, the laws are all in favor of the wealthy. If you look at, um, there are many ways, I mean, in the USA, look at the conviction rates of the rich, it's very f small. And if you look at the poor people, they have much higher conviction rates in the same situation because they cannot hire good lawyers to defend them. So, private property is another deception of economic theory. It says that the rich have absolute rights to their property. You can do whatever you want with it. The Quran uh, states that the Qaum of Shu'ayb said that, O oh Shu'ayb, does your religion prevent us from doing what we want to do with our property? So, in Islam, property is never an uh, absolute right. You are only given it as trust. The absolute ownership of property always belongs to Allah. You are only having it for a short time in your possession. You have to behave responsibly. In Islam, you can be, it can be taken away from you. Uh, so, <coughs> the uh, conventional theory says that there should be no common property because there is the commons problem. But uh, in traditional society, people find a lot of ways to solve the commons problem. They find ways to share equitably with each other in such a way that the resource is not damaged. One of the things is that you share with each other and you have to take care of the future generations. It's a, it's a, that's the idea of trust, that you use it in such a way that it is not damaged for future use. So failure to observe this trusteeship is the cause of massive environmental damage today. Um, the Islam says that natural resources are the gifts of God and they cannot be used, they cannot be privatized. But Kosa's theorem says that if you privatize things, then you get more efficient use out of it. So, uh, 80 90 percent, uh, the Islamic theory has two or th uh, three things which are not existing in the Western theory. One is that the natural resources, the water, the uh, land exactly these are uh, these are uh, for common use they should be used for the benefit of the people so some people have extended this to oil and gas and you know things which are these are the gifts of god to everybody they cannot be privatized so uh, how even if you give control of these to somebody the benefits should be spared sh shared equally over the population and then people have studied that islam has a a very complex any uh, Capitalism is just zero one. You own the property and nobody else can say anything. But Islam has a very complex and varied set of property rules. You own, you have partial ownership. In many cases, you, you are given the property to use, but if you misuse it, it can be taken back from you. And even if you have property, you cannot use it in a way that will cause harm to others. So there are many rules and many uh, solutions to problems which capitalism creates. Again, ut uh, utility maximization is a part of ET1% because it says that it legitimizes the uh, pursuit of pleasure. You can do, and actually it's a religion, uh, it's actually the religion of worship of nafs. Whatever is your desire, you should pursue it. It gives you this uh, pleasure and nobody else should uh, prevent this. But actually... Um, uh, this is haram according to Islamic law. The Quran says that the worship of your nafs is not permissible. And uh, you can oppose it on both empirical grounds and normative grounds in the sense that people don't actually do this. People understand that some of our desires are not actually good for us and not good for society. And also, imp uh, so empirically it's not valid. And also normatively it's not valid. It's not this is the Coca-Cola theory of happiness that 
just drinking coca cola all day will not make you happy even if so it's not not a good normative principle so what is what we can use to oppose this well basically islam has uh, given every human being a uh, potential to be higher than the angels and worse than the beasts so the goal of life the purpose of life is to try to realize the potential that is inside our heart so in particular consumption should be done in the amount necessary to maintain life it is not the object of life uh and uh, once you have enough food then you can pay attention to more important things like developing your character developing your spirituality building your and any spending time on your friends family and other important things not just consumption so we have the um collective social responsibility to provide the basic needs for everybody in the society so that they can pay attention to the more important things the basic needs is provided not because this is the object of life but because what you need to live and once you have what you need to live then you can do the real business of life which doesn't have to do with maximizing consumption so consumption is uh, a low order priority but it's necessary in order that you can do something more important now uh, 81% hide this more important aspect of life from uh, from the view so basically 81% is a deception it's a fraud all of these eight concepts and these are just eight that i have chosen because these are sort of central but there are hundreds of others like that which some of which we mentioned that it's all uh, fraud upon fraud it's deception upon deception it pretends to be something but it is actually something else so all of your uh, uh, fellow classmates there are lots of people who are studying phd in economics they believe that economic theory is a scientific theory which describes the factual reality even though it's yani you see i i have to admire these people they this is a, such a strong deception any it's like saying that in broad daylight the sun is up and somebody says no there is no sun this is midnight and getting people to believe this it's not that it's very difficult to discover this deception is it's almost obvious it's so plain and simple so it's a, it's a master strategy job to uh, get people to believe something which is so obviously false I mean, you get people to believe that you are maximizing your utility function by maximizing non-linear function when you don't even know how to differentiate a complicated function. <laughs> so, ET one percent, all of this deception is designed to protect the interests of the wealthy, and to oppose it, we need Islamic economics, which is designed to protect the interests of the poor and the weak and the general public, and these. two theories are diametrically opposed to each other